about perception, which we've been weeks. doing. This is the 16th week. And last week talked about you need to change your perception for God if you want to be successful. Um, week before that, it was you need to change your perspective about Satan if you want to be successful because the devil ain't got nothing to do with you. He does not need help. We mess up our lives well enough all by ourselves. Right? I learned that a long time ago, man. Today I want to talk about changing your perspective of yourself. What is your self-perspective? If you don't have a good self-perspective, you're going nowhere. You will have problems on top of problems on top of problems. Your healthy self-perspective is what's needed to be successful, to be happy, to stay encouraged. Does your, how happy is your self, or how founded is your self-perception? Does it fluctuate with circumstances and people? Do you feel confident about yourself when things are going right? Do you feel good about yourself when everybody's glad-handing you? And everybody's accepting you? How about when the trials and tribulations come? How about when everybody misunderstands everything you say and do? Does it make you question your, you as an individual? Does it devalue you is what I'm saying. See, a healthy, healthy self-perception, you do not devalue yourself. A healthy self-perception will open up doors or close doors for you. When you go for a job interview, your perception is oozes out of you of what you think of yourself. How you carry yourself, how you speak, how you look in people's eyes or you don't look in their eyes, how you answer the questions, your body language. All of that shows the prospective employer or whoever they may be, how you feel about yourself. And if they're running a company, they don't want a bunch of people working for them that do not value themselves as important. Because if you do not value yourself as important, nothing you do will have importance in it. When you value yourself as important, an insignificant job becomes significant. How many follow what I'm talking about? Self-perception is something nobody can teach you. Your perception of yourself has been molded by what people have said to you when you were young, what people done to you, and what you believed to be true. All of that combined has made, given you an image in your head of who you are. You cannot live beyond your self-perception. I've met individuals, myself included, that I've had all these aspirations and dreams about what I want to do with my life. But yet my perception of myself was just a drug addict thug. I couldn't live beyond that perception of a drug addict thug no matter how big my dream was. Because my perception of myself paved the way for my success or my lack of success. And there's a lot of believers in the body of Christ today that are trying to adhere to, hold on to, and believe the promises of God for themselves, but it's not working because their perception of themselves is wrong. It does not matter how much God wants to bless you. And he does. The Bible says, Jeremiah 29, 11, that he's got a plan for us. It is not God's plan for you to live busted and disgusted. It's not God's plan for you to be broke. It's not God's plan for you to be sick and miserable. It's not God's plan for you to be abused. It's not God's plan for you to be unhappy in life. He says to give you an expected end. God's got a good end for us, but no matter how good of an end he has for us, if our perception is not lined up with him, that plan will come to nothing. It will come to fail. Some people say, well, well you know, God can do anything. Yeah, he can do anything except violate your will or your perception. You can put perception in there without, without changing the scripture at all. God, God will not violate.
perception. He will not make you believe what you can't believe for yourself. Well, how do you know I ain't believing it? Because you ain't acting on it. See, I believed I wanted to be successful, but I lived unsuccessful. Because that was my perception. From one hustle to another hustle to another hustle to another hustle. To jail, another hustle, another hustle, another hustle. Let me film what I'm talking to this morning. But yet, that, that wasn't my idea. That wasn't my plan. My plan was to have a fat bank account. My plan was to be successful. But somehow I couldn't make it work because my standard of living was not matching my perception. Or my perception was matching my standard of living, I should say. All right? Turn your Bibles over to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. And I want to show you that your perception is hindering the plan of God in your life. God has to change our perception. When God appeared to Moses, and God has appeared to many of us, whether visual form, audible form, or in the word, but he's manifested his presence to us where we know that he's God. And when he done that, all right, there was a moment where you had clarity. So I understand what God wants of me now. <laughs> How many of us are really operating in that clarity today? Our perception never grew with our walk with God. Some people have been saved 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and even longer. And their perception of God or themselves has never changed. They've matured, they developed, but their perception of everything, especially themselves, has never really ever changed. Moses, when God appeared to Moses, he spoke to him, he says, I got a mission for you. He says, I want you to go talk to Pharaoh. His perception of himself was, I'm a stutterer. His perception of him is, is I'm a victim because they're going to kill me. That was his perception. God got so frustrated with him that he says, you know what? Shut up. I'm going to send your brother. He's coming after you now. He'll be your spokesman. Over a period of time, Moses' perception of himself changed. We actually started doing what God called him to do, and he started leading Israel out of bondage. He started being a spokesman for God. See, God has called each and every one of us in here to do something. He's called each and every one of us in here to be a representative of him. But our perception is so bad that we can't accept it and walk in it. It's not just our perception. It's the perception that other people have of you. I remember when I got saved and I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I went home and I told my mom because I'm full of the love of God and the power of God flowing through me. God called me to be a preacher, Mom. What's God want with you? See, her perception of me did not fit her perception of a man of God. So the two could never meet. <coughs> My perception of me did not fit the perception of what I thought a man of God was. Geeky and dorky. And let me follow what I'm talking about. Can't relate to nobody. All right. Just, you know, just living on God. I thought that, that God had to change my perception in order for me to walk on my calling. But many of you are inhibiting God from operating in your life because you refuse to change your perception about yourself. I'm going to share something. You are not a loser. Amen. You are not a failure. Amen. You may have failed, but that don't make you a failure. Amen. I failed in my life in many, 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 many things and will continuously yeah. fail. I attempt to do stuff I got no business doing. Right. <laughs> I'm no fans or buts about that. I, I can do it. And then in the middle of the project, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? That don't make me a failure. Right. I'm, I'm a master at, hel at saying help. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> and guess what? Help shows up. Because, oh, I see it now. Now I can do it. Matthew chapter 13 and starting at verse 55. Is this not the carpenter, the son? Is this not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And, and do not all his sisters live here among us? Where then did this man see all this? When they took offense at him, they were repelled and ordered from acknowledging and 
hindered him from acknowledging his authority and caused to stumble. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own house, or his country, and in his own house. And he did not many works of power there because of their what? Their lack of faith in the divine mission of Jesus. He couldn't do much there because of their lack of perception. They couldn't perceive that he was the son of God because after, this is Mary's son. We know his brothers. We know his sister. How can he be the son of God? So their perception hindered him from operating and doing many miracles in that country. Your perception of you is hindering you from doing what God's called you to do. Over the years, I've met many people that have tremendous anointings. And, you know, uh, I give the, the praise to him as an example. Every one of them, God had spoke to me about. They didn't jump and say, oh, I want to be on the praise team. All right, God spoke to me about them. And every one of them said, I can't sing. Every one of them had a thousand excuses of why they couldn't do it. I didn't listen to it. I pushed them anyway. Their perception was, I'm not as good as. Hello? So therefore, I can never do it. But I'll tell you what, each and every one of them are rightfully walking in their own anointing. Something happened over a period of time. They opened up their mouth. God anointed them, and they saw it's not just about tone or singing ability. It's about availability. Right. See, we're looking to, we're looking to uh, uh, qualify ourselves with God with what we can do. God interested in what you can do. He'll give you the ability. He wants to know, are you available for him to give you the ability? And here's what I mean by being available. There was a, a call sent out uh, the other night. I forget what it was. I got a text message. And uh, how many are familiar with 211? 211 is a social program where you need help. You dial that number. Well, they had contacted us and said that there was a gentleman in, in Hayward that uh, needed some food. Um, and uh, um, he had no family or so, so forth. And through a process of time, we finally was able to, to make connection to take care of it. But we sent a message out through our app. I got like three responses within 30 seconds on the app. I got like four different text messages on my phone. You know, those are people that are available. See, that's what available is. Some of us looked like, oh, man, I ain't got time. Neither did these individuals, but they were available, and they made themselves available for God to use them. These are individuals that are not looking at themselves and say, what do I have to offer? There was a need, and they said, here am I. Do you hear what I'm saying? So many of us, we're supposed to be available, but we're not available. Yeah. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not, you know, the, the, you know what I'm saying. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Is the Bible or your perception changing your life? If your perception is or is not changing your life, you're offended with everything people say. Is it hot in here? Yeah. Okay, I got the solution. I got the solution. I got the solution. Those of you that are hot, move to that side. Because this side's cooler. <laughs> if your perception is molding your life, you're offended with what people say. You're offended with what people do. Here's what the word says. It says, them that love the word are not easily offended. So because everything they do, everything they say, everything they experience with other people is channeled through their knowledge of the word. That does not mean they sit there and go, well, 2 Corinthians 10 says, no. David said, that word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When an experience or a situation comes by, instinctively because they're walking in the faith and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, it's filtered through the word of God because their mind's been transformed and they're thinking word without knowing their thinking word. In other words, they're responding to the situation by the word that's been hidden in their heart. People that don't operate like that are operating or, uh, out of their own perception. And there will be the ones always putting their foot in their mouth, offending people, saying, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Because you're operating out of your own perception. You're allowing your perception.
Jew, your perception to mold your circumstances. How many times have you yelled at somebody, went off on somebody, and felt like a fool in the end when you realized it wasn't like you thought it was? Or maybe you as a bigger fool never realized it. I'm not saying that. The Bible says a fool, is, a fool is right in his own eyes, right? In the end, we have to realize, you know what, man? Maybe I overstepped my boundaries. I went off on them. I blew up on them, and they didn't even guilty of what I thought they were guilty of. It was my perception. What's molding you? Your perception or the Bible? Turn your Bibles over to Psalms 119. And prayerfully, we we'll stand here today and we we'll say, the Bible is molding me. The Word of God is changing me. The Word of God is cleansing me. The Word of God is delivering me. Because you're still allowing your perception to change you. You're going nowhere in your salvation. I'll tell you that right now. Psalms 119, verse 105. Here's what David said. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He says, your word will bring me out of darkness. Your word will bring revelation. Your word will bring understanding. Your word will give me guidance. What does your perception do for you? Much of nothing. Much of nothing. Your perception is usually wrong because it's channeled through the hurts, habits, and hang-ups we've had. It's only when you filter your life through the Word of God do you think and see clearly. Right? As I said earlier, you're not a mistake. You're not a failure. No matter what your perception is of yourself today, it needs to change. If you have a good perception, it needs to get gooder. All right? If nobody's told you, I want to tell you this morning, you are special. Not special. You're special. <laughs> you are very, very special. Each and every single one of us. I had a habit. I had a problem with that. Me being special. I am not, and you are not only special, you are uniquely special. You know what that means? Only one of you. When God, Baba says that we're made in his image. Right? When God designed me, he goes, you know what? I can't top that. So let me make another one. And when he made that one, when he made Charlie, he says, I can't top that. So let me make another one. When God made you, he says, you're cool. Okay. Oh, but I got lumps and bumps. Those lumps and bumps are what God gave you. And God said, he's happy with it. You are special. Listen to this. Just the way you are. See, we're living in a society today where perfection is cut and trimmed. and It's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. And it's given our young women a, 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 a perverted view of, of what beauty is. You are perfect just the way you are. What makes you ugly is your perception of what you are. Amen. I've seen individuals that weren't all that according to society standards. But they carried themselves with an authority and with a confidence that blew me away. They were some that said, you know what? I don't care what society's perception of me is. I feel good about me all by myself. And I can do this. Unless you have that perception, not based on somebody's acceptance, not based on somebody's approval, your perception of you has to have value all by itself. When you have that kind of value, people will accept you just as you are. But when they see they can manipulate your perception, they will play you and cause you to buy into their program. That's why you buy all those hundreds of dollars every year on makeup. Come on, talk to me. Just so you could look like whoever. That's why we spend hours and hours and hours, not me, but we spend hours and hours and hours at the gym trying to look buff like the guy in the last movie. That's his job. He gets paid to look like that.
cook. He's got a trainer. He gets paid for that. You're buying into an image that's imperfect because you don't value you. I like me with my roles. I would like me more if I didn't have so many roles. But I'm not going to dislike me because I got roles. How many know what I'm talking about? We got to stop placing value on what we look like to other people and look naked in the mirror and say, I like that. I said that. When you could look at yourself naked in the mirror from every angle. And walk away and say, ooh, I'm looking good. You got some good value. You may not think I look good, but I do. And guess what? You ain't paying my bills. So the only opinion that matters is mine. I look good. Turn around and tell somebody you look good. Man. That's right. Turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. You got to understand that you are special. You are special. The Bible says we are special. Fearfully and wonderfully made. The enemy understands that. That's why he attacks. That's why he attacks us. That's why he attacks your mind. That's why he attacks your opinion of yourself. Because he knows that if you understand you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that there's nothing impossible to you because now you've got a confidence that can't be shaken. See, we're trying to get confidence and boldness and all this other stuff. You, that boldness and confidence from outside does not work. It's got to come from within first. There was a woman, a shame on people, because they, 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 they deemed her the ugliest woman on the Internet. Yes. I don't know if you ever saw her. She had some kind of disease. I forget what it was, but she looked anorexic. Her eyes were, I mean, there was just, a, you know, she, they deemed, herself, deemed her as being the ugliest woman on the Internet, sent her hate mail and all kinds. You know what this woman did? She turned around, and she is a motivational speaker talking to kids about self-awareness and self-acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. She didn't allow everybody's opinion. She, she, she said, I know I ain't that good looking. She said, but I am who I am. And she is a motivational speaker. <laughs> Remember that guy with no arms and no legs? Motivational speaker. Dave Reaver burned his face, his hands, his body, All right, totally disfigured, motivational speaker. What's wrong with you? These are men and women that, according to the world, they have no value, they have no standard because they're not fit in society, the beauty of our society today. Who says you're overweight? (laughs) Who says you're fat? Besides you. And the reason we do it is to deflect so nobody else says it. Because we're afraid of their opinion. Like you, I don't care how skinny, how heavy, how tall, how short, how kinky your hair is, how straight your hair is, whether you got flat nose, big nose, pug nose, no nose, it doesn't matter. Like yourself. Like yourself. Because you have to like yourself because you have value. I can't get that across today. I'm probably stuck on this whole principle right here. You have value because God placed it on you. And if you understand your value, you'll do something with it. If you don't understand your value, you're just going to sit there, and you're not going to do a thing. And the devil knows that, so all he has to do is is get you to feed on your on your problems and what people said about you, what people thought about you, what people act about act with you, and they say, "Well, I'm no good." You see, your insecurities show when you meet people. Hi, how you doing? I'm an ex-everything. Failed at everything I've ever done, including pastoring. But I refuse to hang my, not in defiance. I'm not being defiant about this. I'm not going to allow your stupid little petty thinking mind to put me into a bondage when God set me free. See, I know I'm free. I don't think I'm free. I know I'm free. I'm free of your opinion of me. Do you know how free that is? That's free. That's indeed free. But you got to be free from your own opinion and adapt God's opinion. See, his opinion is the only one that counts. 
Every little boy, every little girl. The only opinion that matters to them is their fathers. Yeah, that's right, right. Nobody else's opinion matters to them. And if a man of God will do nothing but infuse his daughter, infuse his son with positive things, that child will grow up and do something wonderful. Right. We're all craving for daddy's approval. That's right. that comes from our relationship with our father. Yeah. And he approved of you. So if he approved of you and you know he approved of you, get up and do something. Stop whining about who you are. And, and please stop saying, oh, my God, I grew up like this and I grew up like that. And then I got beat. And I, it's over. It's done. That does not nullify who you are today. I've been rejected and cast aside and pushed by my whole family. And I had a bad perception of me. But I got born again. You know what I'm saying? And I got a born-again experience that changed me. And this is what God said in his word. Ephesians 1 and 4. Um, yeah, 4. Even as in his love, he chose who? He chose you. Out of his love, he chose you. He actually picked you out for himself as his own. Anybody here play baseball or kickball when you were a kid and were the last one picked? I feel sorry for you guys. <laughs> because, uh, because that's bad. <laughs> that's it there. I don't want him. You take it. I don't want him. You take it. <laughs> God said, no, you know what? I looked over at eons of people and I specifically said, I want you. He says he chose you. It's an awesome feeling to get chosen the first or second one. Because you know they want you. But when you're down the last two or three, so man, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel now. God did not scrape the bottom of the barrel for you. He said he looked out over everybody. He deliberately chose you for himself. And listen to this. Before the foundation of the earth. You know what that means? Before you were born, before you messed up, before you even a thought, you were already a reality in God's mind. And God says, you know what? I don't care. I love them, and I'm calling them. What if they mess up? I don't care. Yes. What if they don't measure up to your standard? I don't care. I call them. Yes. I'm deliberately choosing them. Nothing and nobody can take that away Amen. except your perception. Right. John 15, 16, he says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Right. We like to take a break. Well, here I am, God. Hallelujah. No, he chose you. You're here because he chose you. The scripture says, no man can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. You know what it means? God overlooked all of your evil, sinful ways. God looked at all the anger you had against him and said, it don't mean nothing. God looked at all the hatred and the murderous thoughts you had and said, it means nothing. I still love them. God looked at all the rebellion and all the dysfunctionalism and says, I still want them. I've chosen you. And you know, he, said, he says even further, he goes, now I call you my friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. How does a friend of God act? I mean, think about this. God is your backup. We're not getting that. Amen. See, I had friends that had big brothers. And they'd go out through the neighborhood and go, oh, my brother's going to do this. My brother's going to do that to you. When you got a big brother that you think can whip the world, you get a big mouth on you. Yeah. My sister did that to me one time. And we were adults. <laughs> we lived in Hayward. And this guy talking mess about me, what he's going to do. I go, whoa, 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 what's up? Man? He goes, well, your sister says you're going to do that. Look, my sister don't speak for me. But here she's running around thinking she's King Kong because she got a brother. Yeah. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> we have better than a brother behind our back. And we're living in security. We're living in fear. We're living in doubt. We're living in frustration. We're living afraid of everything when we got a big brother. What does that do for your self-esteem when you know your big brother's here? Shoot, let me walk anywhere with Bruce Lee. I'm cool. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm cool, man. See, I didn't say Denzel Washington. He's Hollywood. Bruce Lee was real. Yeah. yeah.
walk in with Bruce Lee, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not afraid of nothing. Why? I got, well, he's little. I don't care. He's mighty. Yeah. When you know who you have behind you, it changes your perception of you. We've got to know. You, you know, you've got to know beyond the shadow of a doubt. First Corinthians one twenty twenty seven says, God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I like the Amplified. It says, God deliberately chose what in the world is foolish to put the, shame, the wise to shame and what the world calls weak to put the strong to shame. In your imperfections, in your failures, in your addictions, in your sickness, God said, I see something in you that nobody else does. So I'm calling you out from among them. I'm calling you to be separate so that my power can be manifest in you. Is this going to happen overnight? No, it's not going to happen overnight because it takes a while for our perception to change. The Bible says here, there, here, there, little there. Line upon line, precept upon precept. A wrong self-perception is disabling. You can hear the word of God and you know all the promises of God and you can know they're real. But if you don't know they're for you, it's disabling. If you don't realize you have the ability, it's disabling. If you don't realize God's already done everything he's going to do, he's expecting you to do something now. First and foremost, he wants you to believe that he called you. He wants you to believe that he's filled you with authority. Go over to Numbers chapter 13. Self-perception does more to damage us than anything else. Because if we don't have a good perception about ourselves, we'll settle in abusive relationships, abusive jobs. They're working you like a slave and paying you nothing. You deserve more, but they don't give it to you, so you stay there because that's what you're accustomed to. So this has got to be, no, you're worth more than that. See, when you have a healthy perception about yourself, listen to this. You don't settle. You refuse to settle. My son, when he was like just getting to age to start looking for work, um, of course I wanted him to go to work. Start learning how to do the things he's supposed to be doing as a man. And uh, I talked to some people at Wiener Schnitzel for him, and they were going, hey, yeah, we're hiring. I said, Jake, go over there and get a job. They're hiring. He asked me how much they were making. I told him. He goes, I ain't going to wear one of those hats. Well, he didn't want to wear the hat and he didn't want to go to work there because he knew he was worth more. He had a higher value. His first job, he didn't wear that hat. I'm trying to get him to settle. It's a job, son. You got to start somewhere. How many know what I'm talking about? Well, yeah, but in his opinion, he was more value than a hot dog on his head. (laughs) <laughs> my opinion is a dad it's a job it's bringing us some money for yourself you know? right. but he refused to compromise what had already been deposited in him how many follow what I'm saying and, and he followed through and he got his job and career and so forth and so on but he refused to settle how many of us have settled we have people settling for marriages all the time it's not the man or the woman which you want, but nobody else is knocking at your door, so let me go ahead and do it now. Come on, I'm being real. You know this is how we're thinking, man. You know, well, it's not the best job in the world, so I'm saying, well, if it's not the best job in the world, do something so that you can educate yourself so you can give somebody something, offer them where they want you more, right? It's not the, you know, best place to be, but it's okay. Stop settling. What happens when you settle, you're never happy with it. And you will never take care of it. You will never prepare for it. You never never maintain it or keep it because you settled. But when you know this is the best that you've got and the best that you want, guess what you do? You nurture it. You take care of it. You you, you value it. You value it. What do you not value?
you settled. It could be anything from a car, anything, anything. You don't value it because you settled. Numbers chapter 13. Your self-perception is defeated. It's the defeatist attitude. The scripture says, I can do all things. What does that mean? You can do it. You mean, I could become whatever you want to become. Well, I wasn't good in school. Well, that's because you were a screw-up. You had the wrong perception. Try it now. We use that excuse all the time. Well, I don't like school because... Well, you didn't like school because you went to school in the hood and nobody wanted to go to school and there was nothing but problems there. You go to school as an adult now. People are there because they want to be there. It's a whole different perception, percent perspective. You find people that will help you understand your work. How many follow what I'm saying? We have that defeatist attitude and it destroys us. Starting in verse 30. Actually, starting, yeah, verse 30. Caleb quieted the people because Moses had said, let us go up at once and possess. We are well able to conquer it. But his fellow scouts said, we are not able to go up and conquer the people in Canaan, for they are stronger than we are. We have two different perceptions here. Moses' camp said, go in and take it. Yeah, we could take it. Another camp says, no, they're stronger than us. So they brought... Israel, the uh, Israelites, an evil report of the land. When they had scouted out, saying, The land through which we went in to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Then we saw, listen to this. These are the very same people that came out of Egypt, that wandered through the wilderness, that cities were closing their doors on them because they heard they were coming. These are the very same people that tore down the walls of Jericho with a shout. Now they go into a land, they go, oh my God, this, we're, we, we're overwhelmed, this land is so big. They said that we're overwhelmed, there's giants in the land. The giant in the land was not the problem. Their perception of themselves was the problem. You can acknowledge there's a problem in front of you. You can acknowledge there's an obstacle in front of you. That obstacle or that problem is not a problem. Your perception of that problem or that giant. Zechariah chapter 4, it says, Who art thou, O mountain, that, shall, that stand before Zerubbabel, but thou shalt come down with shoutings of grace, grace, joy. You know what he's saying? He goes, there's a mountain ahead of me, but I'm not concerned with that mountain that's trying to stop me from going over because that mountain's going to come down with shoutings of praise. But how many of us look at that mountain and, oh, my God, it's so hard. I go back to school. It's going to be four years to get my degree. Okay, so don't go to school and time stops. (laughs) Nothing ever happened again after that. Four years went by. And you know what happened? Four years go by again. And four years go by again. And four years go by again. Pretty soon you know it. You're 70 years old. Well, I'm too old now. No, you ain't. You ain't never too old (coughs) to put your hand to the plow. There we saw the Nephilim, or the giants, (coughs) the sons of Enoch, who came from the giants. And we were, listen to this. Here's my perception of us. We were as grasshoppers in our own sight. You know what I'm saying? I felt insignificant. In the midst of looking at these giants. I'm incapable. Don't have the ability to stand and fight against what's in front of me. Because I'm a grasshopper. And they're a giant. You ever heard that saying, you can't fight City Hall? It's people with a bad perception. People fought City Hall and won. Numerous times. Take on the giant. Stop empowering the giants in your life over you. And this is the worst part about it. His self-perception made him believe that the other people looked at him. 
He said, we were grasshoppers in our own eyes as we were in theirs. Let me share something with you. I'm not a small guy. I'm not a big guy. But I've had fights with some guys that were not my size that come running up on me. First thing in my mind was, whoa, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? You ever see those guys, they're, 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 they're like four foot two, but they take nothing from nobody and they run up on everybody? Say, so, man, this guy, he knows something and you make you back up a little bit. Do you hear what I'm saying? Their size didn't mean nothing. What, what, what disabled their ability was what they thought the giants viewed them as. I guarantee you, if they went running crazy after that giants, the giants would have got shocked and backed up. Okay, maybe we ain't got no old street people in here. But I was told all you got to do is act crazy. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter how many they are. Just get crazy and they, they don't know what to do. Don't fear what's in front of you. Get crazy. Why aren't you backing up? Because I ain't afraid. Why aren't you giving up? Because I ain't got enough sense and I'm going to win this thing. You know, most people by now quit your age. It doesn't matter. There's no quit in me. We got to make that our mantra. There's no quit in me. Why not? Because I know I'm better than quitting. I know I'm, I'm worth more than quitting. Guess what happens when you quit? You stop. It's disabling. Your past victories have nothing to do with your present self-perspective. Your past victories have nothing to do with how you perceive yourself today because every circumstance opens up another set of challenges that's going to challenge your perception of yourself. Can you do this? Oh, I don't know. Why not? Because I'm afraid of challenges because I might fail. That means you've got the seed of failure sitting in your spirit and what happened is you're watering it Every single time. God did not design you to fail. God designed you to success. Life set you up to fail and you believed it's lies. I don't care what it is. God did not call you to work by, well, the Bible says we work by the sweat of, the, uh, sweat of our brow because of the curse. But he says, I'll make you the head and not the tail. I was listening to... Um, uh, Prince, what's his name? Yeah, Joseph Prince. And it was saying that almost every single invention has been, that's come to society today, has come through either a Christian or the Jewish people. Enlightened individuals. How many Christians we got here? Enlightened. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the author of witty inventions. We're enlightened, but we don't have enough confidence or feel good about ourselves to carry through what the Holy Spirit gives us. So we let those dreams die. Because every time I tried to share my dream with somebody, they laughed. Well, they laughed at the Wright brothers too. Christians. They were Christians. Today we're flying around the world because their perception of themselves was able to endure people laughing at them and mocking them and criticizing them and, 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 and so forth because they valued themselves as a person. How many of us really, really need to work on valuing ourselves and it's going to take more than standing in the mirror saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Because you're going to come up against circumstances. They're going to challenge your perception. And the Bible says, when you've done all you can do, stand. Your past victories do not determine how healthy your self-perception is. Your present victory does. Your present, not your past ones. 
Because that's over with. You felt good at that time, but now a new problem comes, a new trial comes, a new battle comes. Time for you to man up. Stand up. And say, I'm going, th- I'm going through this one like I did the other. Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Hallelujah. First Samuel 17. Actually, start in verse 8. Goliath stood up and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come to bat- draw the battle and Am I not Philistines, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be my servants and serve us. And the Philistines said this to defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may gather together. Listen, Saul had seasoned soldiers. They knew how to go to battle. They conquered all the other uh, 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 countries around them, all the other cities. They were not an untested group of people. And every time you get a victory, what's it do for your confidence? One victory after another victory after another victory after another victory. Pretty soon, you know what? Yeah, go to battle without thinking about it. We're going to battle. Yeah, let's go. But their past victories had nothing to do with their perception for the moment. See, the vast past victories were based on a group. Uh, that, that's not the word. On how everybody thought as a group. How everybody thought the army was. Saul's army is strong as a group. But as individuals, they were weak. You hear what I'm saying? Because if their perception, each and every one of them had the proper perception of who they were as a soldier. They wouldn't have had to wait for David to come by. They knew they were strong soldiers together. But individually, they did not have a good enough perception of themselves or their ability and their skills as a soldier to fight this enemy. Let's read. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Can you imagine soldiers being afraid? There's nothing wrong with being, with being fearful because fear is, a natural, fear is natural. But what does that fear make you do? Does it make you run and hide or does it make you go to battle? These were seasoned soldiers that should have went to battle. But they only had that mob mentality. We're strong as long as we're in the mob. Separated from the mob and I don't know if I can do that. Many of us are like that. We feel good about ourselves when there's other people around us. But when I have to face this by myself, come on, go with me. Come on, I don't want to go by myself. Go in there with me. You're my strength. No, God is your strength. And he said, I'll go wherever you go. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, go go with me. You know I don't know how to talk to people. Go in there. How many follow what I'm saying? We get that mob mentality, and we can do anything. But how about when it's nobody but you? When it's nobody but you. See, your perception changes your focus, or your focus changes your perception. What are you focusing on? David never did focus on the size of Goliath. He focused on the bigness of his God. These soldiers that were supposed to have been trained killers, trained soldiers, focused on the size of Goliath. They didn't trip on or focus or think about their past victories. They didn't think about that where God's anointed. They didn't.
We're the, we're, the, we're the servants of the king. I got all these people behind me. They thought of this stuff individually. What if you lose and I'm going to become his servant? There was no, there's no losing when you have a healthy self-perception of yourself and you step out. There is no losing. All you're going to do is gain. Go t- turn your Bibles over to Numbers chapter 13. I'm sorry, John, uh, uh, jo- uh, Joshua 14. Joshua 14. Focus changes your perception. Why do you think the enemy has you focusing on all the negatives in your life? Focusing on all the losses in your life. Focusing on all the pain in your life. Focusing on who don't like you. I personally don't care who don't like me. I really, 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 really don't. It don't bother me if they like me or they love me or they hate me. It doesn't change me. I personally don't care to hear what somebody has to say about me. That's their business. It doesn't change me. I'm not buying their mail. Why is that? Because I want to protect how I feel about me. And if it's not positive... And it's not constructive. Yep. Come on. Hear what I'm saying? Constructive? Sometimes people got something good to say to us that we may not like because it's the truth and we're not ready for the truth. We think it's mean, yeah. hateful, yeah. but it can be constructive. But other than that, you shouldn't care what people think about you. But because we don't have a healthy opinion of ourselves, we do care about what people think about us. And if we don't, then we, we, we kid ourselves and we're in defiance about, well, I don't care what they think about me anyway. Well, and you don't think you have a good, healthy self-opinion either. You're trying to buy into something that you haven't really got a hold of yet. Right? Okay. Joshua chapter 14. And starting at verse um, 10. And now, uh, behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he said, these 45 years, since the Lord spoke the word to Moses, while the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, and now behold, I am this day 85 years old. Wait a minute. This is the same man that stood against the people that had a bad opinion of the giants in the land. All right? For 40 years, he had to deal with people that had a bad self-image that had a bad image about God. He stood there and he's telling them, God will take us through. But there's giants in the land and we're grasshoppers in their eyes and we're grasshoppers in our eyes. Listen, he had to overcome more than his self-perception. If I have to wander around 40 minutes (laughs) for you, I'm going to get frustrated. How many follow I'm talking about? Turn here. And then it's t- you took me 40 minutes out of my way. Man, I ain't going to be happy about it. But for 40 years, he had to deal with these individuals and not allow it to make him bitter, angry, because his perception was those things take me away from the promise. Those things take me away from my God. Those things remove me from the blesser. Not the blessing, but the blesser. So I'm guarded because, you know what, I value who I am enough not to let those things settle in my spirit. So for 40 years, he wandered in the wilderness thinking about nothing but the promise. Do you hear this? When you have a healthy self-perception, it doesn't matter what you're going through. Your eyes and your heart and your mind is fixed on the promise. Well, what is the promise for me in this ruggedness, in this state, in this condition, in this life that I'm living in now, with destruction all around me? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no test, trial, or temptation taking you, but is common to man, but God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation, trial, or test make a way whereby you're able to escape it. That's the promise. In the midst of the fire, in the midst of the struggle, God, you said you're not going to give me anything I can't handle. You put me in here. You told me I can go through it. God, I'm going to handle it, and I'm going to keep my heart, my mind set on thee because you're going to bring me through it because you said you would. 
The other generation from 40 years down had to pass. 20 years down had to pass. They had to die. So this man here, this 85-year-old man, had to wait for a whole new generation to rise up. And he had to maintain his healthy perception. And he says, I'm 85 years old. And I love this. I love this. This is me. This is my heart's desire. This is my goal. This is what I'm living for. This is where I'm going. He turned around. He looked at all them youngsters in the congregation. And he says, I'm 85 years old. And I could still fight. I could still go to battle. And I could still come back. He goes, get out of my way. I want my mountain. Listen. God did not give you old age. Let me tell you something. It's a privilege denied to a lot of people. So that you could sit down, knit one, pearl two, change the TV, wear my lunch, get my pills, I can go sleep. You have value and worth at 60, 70, 80, 90. Your value does not die because you are old age. Your old age is a gift from God. I hope I'm not getting my older brothers and sisters upset. Yes, I am. I'm hoping you get upset with me. I'll show you. Show me. <laughs> Rise up. You have ability. You have might. That's my hero. I read that. I go, God, I want to. I am going to be that. I'm going to be 65 next year. All right. Listen, I got to do something I ain't never done before just to do it. How many follow what I'm talking about? Amen. How old are you, Rick? 70. Dancing. Up. Huh? Going to the gym. Amen. Now, I go to a youngster, and I don't want to do that to embarrass them. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> Your life is not over because you got numbers. How many follow this? See, when I was growing up, we'd go to grandfather's house. He was sitting on the porch. Grandma was sitting on the couch. And it was like, I don't want to go over there. I remember those. It's stale. It's musty. It's, it's like they're waiting for death, man. As a believer, we're not waiting on death. We're fighting it. Why? We have value. We have value, and your value doesn't cease until God takes you home. When he takes you home, he goes, you know what? You're done. Now I'm going to show you your real value. I'm going to give you an incorruptible crown. Amen. Amen. What is your perception of yourself? It's got to be great. See, the Bible, you know, we, we like that false humility. Well, I don't want to think too highly of myself. You know, I want to be full of pride. Man, if you only knew what I think about me. <laughs> Amen. I feel good about me. Even in my mistakes, I feel good about me. I enjoy every stupid thing I do. I, I lose my keys 15 times a day. Kid you not, man. It's a, I just go through it, man. I'll leave my house, man. Oh, my God, I got to go back. I just go through it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I don't say, you idiot, you stupid. No. Here we go again. <laughs> again. I feel too good about me to call myself stupid. I feel too good about me to call myself fat. Come on, talk to me. I feel too good about me to call myself incompetent. I'm not. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. He gave you the ability. He gave, stop listening to what people, stop listening to the things that were said 20, 30, 40 years ago. The Bible says, he that is here, let me hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Listen to what God's saying to you. Amen. What he's saying, I, he says, I, I've called you, ordained you, and chosen you. I've appointed you. He called you, ordained you, chose you, and appointed you. And you're not walking in it because you say, well, gee, I don't, I, I, I don't.
No, I don't know. Paul said, I don't know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What do you mean? He had letters. He had accreditations. He was a scholar. He was somebody. But he says, I don't know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified because he realized that's where his power, that's where his ability came from. You may not know how to put together a sermon or Bible study. You may not know two scriptures, but do you have a relationship with the Father? When you have a relationship with the Father, it changes everything. It should change you. He'll fill you with a holy boldness. A holy boldness. Come on, give the Lord a praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Walk out of here as king's kids. Walk out of here. To, uh, more importantly, walk back in that way. Don't allow the word. Man, I've heard this in churches week after week after week. Man, Oh, my God. You know, we're going on to the world. It's going to be a rough one. And then come back. Hump day, we made it. Let's get filled again. No, stay filled. Stay filled. Don't allow yourself to get, you know, the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. All right? That-